On April the 19th, 1995, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols conspired to blow up the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City. Anti-government militant Timothy McVeigh parked a truck outside the building that was packed with explosives, which he detonated before fleeing the scene. The blast and resulting building collapse killed at least 160 people and injured 680. The explosion destroyed or damaged 324 other buildings within a 16 block radius, shattered glass in 258 nearby buildings and destroyed or burned 86 cars, causing an estimated $652 million worth of damage. Until the 2001 September the 11th attacks, the Oklahoma City bombing was the worst terrorist attack ever carried out on American soil. Most people would be appalled at such an act, but for 18-year-old Eric Harris and 17-year-old Dylan Klebold, it was the inspiration behind the mass shooting at Columbine High School, and it all took place almost to the day four years later. April 20th, 1999 was a beautiful spring morning and best friends Dylan Klebold and Eric Harris are up early. But this is no ordinary day for the boys. This is a day they had been planning for months. A day they had called NBK, Natural Born Killers. The two boys met at the local grocery store where Eric was seen purchasing a propane gas tank. These were the final preparations for the 99 improvised bombs the pair had been building for months using instructions from the internet. They had also acquired and adapted two 9mm firearms, two shotguns and a carbine, plus knives, all of which were stored in a closet in Eric's bedroom. The boys took the gas tanks back to Eric's house at around 7am, they then split up. Eric prepared the bombs and Dylan fetched gasoline. Everything was meticulously planned. They had even made time to eat and chill. At around 11am, the two made their way to Columbine High School. It was the school they both attended in Colorado and was about to become the site of one of the deadliest mass shootings in modern United States history. The boys drove separately to school. On the way, they dumped two backpacks with pipe bombs, aerosol canisters and small propane tanks in a grassy open space three miles southwest of Columbine High School and set the timer to 11.14am. The explosion was intended as a diversion to draw firefighters and emergency services away from the school so they could prolong their attack. Once the boys arrived at the school, they parked in different areas. Their primary bomb target was the school cafeteria. Dylan walked to Eric's car and the boys calmly walked into the cafeteria with duffel bags containing propane bombs. They placed the bags alongside other students' bags as they prepared to take their lunch. These devices were set to detonate at 11.17am. The boys then calmly went back to their separate cars to await the explosion, and they planned to shoot survivors as they fled the building. While walking back to his car, Eric encountered his friend Brooks Brown. Brooks asked him why he had not attended a class test earlier that morning, and Eric simply replied, It doesn't matter anymore. Brooks, I like you now. Get out of here. Go home. But the cafeteria bombs failed to explode, so after waiting for a short time, the boys walked towards the school. Both were armed with sawn-off shotguns, and they positioned themselves and prepared to shoot. Klebold and Harris had also left bombs with timers in their cars, set to go off once they went back into the school. Had the bombs exploded at full force, there is no doubt that all 488 students in the cafeteria at that time would have been killed or seriously injured. From their position at the top of the steps, they began shooting at students in the area, and Eric could be heard shouting, go, go. Their first victims were 17-year-old Rachel Scott, who was sat on the lawn eating lunch with her friend Richard Castaldo. Rachel was mercilessly shot four times by Eric, and she died instantly. 
Richard was shot eight times, but miraculously survived, paralyzed from the waist down. Students Daniel Rawborough, Sean Graves, and Lance Kirklin came outside on their way to the smoker's pit, and all three were shot and fell to the ground. Five students, sitting on the grass to the west of the stairs, were shot as they began to run. Michael Johnson suffered a gunshot wound, but was able to reach a storage shed where he took cover. Mark Taylor suffered a debilitating gunshot wound and fell to the ground, unable to flee with the others. Dylan then went back down the stairs and shot Daniel Rawborough and Lance Kirkland again at close range. Daniel was killed instantly, but Lance survived. He then went back and joined Eric at the top of the outside stairs, where Anne Mary Hotchholter was shot multiple times as she tried to run for cover. Witnesses heard one of the gunmen shout, this is what we always wanted to do, this is awesome. Initially, some of the students inside the school believed that seniors were playing some sort of prank. However, it soon became apparent that this was no prank. Eric and Dylan were rampaging and randomly shooting whoever was in their path. They were also throwing pipe bombs, although very few of them detonated. At 11.22, Deputy Neil Gardner, the assigned resource officer to Columbine, was called to the senior parking lot. Around the same time, a 911 call was received from a Columbine High School student, who reported that a girl was injured in the south lower parking lot. Realising the seriousness of the situation, several of the school's custodial staff started directing students to get down and they began to hide under tables and desks. Deputy Paul Smoker, a motorcycle patrolman for the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, heard on his radio about a girl down at Columbine School, and he radioed dispatch to say that he was responding and making his way to the school. Teacher Patty Nielsen was working as a hall monitor when she heard a commotion outside. Thinking it was senior students messing around with a toy gun, she headed out to tell them to knock it off before one of the shooters fired at her, causing glass and metal fragments to spray into the hallway. Nielsen was hit by debris and suffered abrasions to her shoulder, forearm and knee. Luckily for Nielsen, Eric and Dylan became distracted as they hear the siren of Deputy Gardner approaching. He now becomes their main target and as soon as he steps out of his patrol car, Eric started shooting at him. After about 10 shots, Eric's weapon jammed and Gardner shot back, although neither of the boys were hit. Eric turned around and headed back into the school. By now, the students realised the seriousness of the situation and tried to escape from the canteen area. Patty Nielsen, who was now hiding under a counter in the school library, called 911 and Gardner called for backup. By now, Jefferson County deputies Scott Taborski and Paul Smoker have arrived on the scene and are attending to two wounded students. Eric spotted them and from a broken window leaned out and started shooting at Smoker. Smoker fired back and Eric retreated back inside. Throughout, teacher Patty Nielsen continued her phone contact with the Jefferson County dispatcher. The gunmen then turned their attention to students inside the library. They killed four and injured four more in the west area before moving back towards the library entrance to the east. There they shot at the display cabinet near the front door before shooting at eight more students, injuring five and killing three, before reloading their weapons and killing two more students in the library's centre section. In a seven and a half minute spree, ten people are killed and twelve are wounded in the library. Of the 56 people in the area at the time, only 34 escape uninjured. During this killing spree, Eric's shotgun kickback had broken his nose when he crouched down to shoot Cassie Bernal, point-blank range, who was under a table. At 11.33am, the Jefferson County SWAT team were called in. Just before they arrived, the last student is shot dead at around 11.35 in the Central Library. Dylan and Eric then made their way to the science area. Witnesses later recalled that although they were looking through the windows of the locked classroom doors, making eye contact with terrified students, they did not attempt to shoot at them or break down doors. Instead, they fired shots into empty rooms. Klebold and Harris left the science area and went down into the cafeteria, where CCTV shows Eric on the stair railing, firing shots at one of the bags containing an unexploded bomb, but again, it fails to detonate. The pair then drank from the many bottles left by fleeing students and a witness hiding in the cafeteria, he had one of the gunmen say, 
Today, the world's going to come to an end. Today's the day we die. Harris and Klebold were in the cafeteria for around two and a half minutes, and they eventually managed to partially detonate one of the bombs, causing a fire that activates the sprinklers. At 11.52 a.m., Jefferson County Under Sheriff John Dunaway arrived at the command post and authorized SWAT teams to make an immediate entry into the school. By this time, Eric and Dylan seemed to be aimlessly roaming around the school. At 12.05, the shooting from the library towards officers stopped. Between 12.05 and 12.07, the conversations between Eric and Dylan would have been brief. It's speculated that when seeing the mass of police officers gathering outside the school, they realized it was all over and jail was not an option for either of them. At approximately 12.07 p.m., Eric leaned up against a bookshelf and positioned his Savage 67H pump shotgun between his legs, placing the barrel inside of his mouth before pulling the trigger, blowing off the back portion of his head. Dylan got down onto his knees right next to Eric, lit a petrol bomb and threw it or placed it on a desk next to him, and aimed his Tech 9 semi-automatic handgun at his left temple before pulling the trigger. A 9mm bullet cut through his brain, but he didn't die instantly, and according to the autopsy, Klebold likely suffered from involuntary movement while his lungs filled with blood, causing him to drown. Patrick Ireland, who was inside the library, later stated he could hear what he believes was Dylan coughing and gargling after he had shot himself. For the boys, it was all over. In the aftermath of the shooting, it emerged that 12 students and one teacher had lost their lives, and 21 were injured, some with life-altering injuries. A further three were hurt trying to escape the carnage, and these were just the physical injuries. The psychological trauma caused by the Columbine massacre continues to this day. Eric was responsible for eight of the 13 confirmed deaths, including that of a teacher, while Dylan was liable for the remaining five. So what made these two seemingly ordinary boys turn into killers in such an extreme way? It's a question I've been asking since heavily researching this case. Were there signs? Could they have been stopped? Or were they born to kill? Eric David Harris was born on the 9th of April, 1981 in Kansas. He was the second son of Wayne and Catherine. Due to the nature of his father's work in the Air Force, in his early years, he moved around a lot before finally settling in Littleton, Colorado, after Wayne's forced retirement in 1993. From all accounts in his early life, he was just a regular kid who had a good relationship with his older brother, Kevin, and his parents. If you look at photographs of him as a child, he looks clean cut and confident. There's nothing in his demeanor in those early years to indicate what he would turn into. When the family moved to Colorado, Eric went to Ken Carroll Middle School, where he met Dylan Klebold. The pair became close friends and spent a lot of time together. They shared a passion for computers and video games, and Eric in particular became obsessed with the game Doom. The two later went on to attend Columbine High School and were part of a close-knit group of friends that included Brooks Brown and Nate Dykeman. Maybe the first sign that Eric was troubled was during his freshman year when he met Tiffany Typher and took her to the homecoming. But when she refused to go out with him again, he staged a fake suicide, lying on the ground and covering himself with fake blood. In the years that followed, Eric became increasingly erratic. In 1997, he and Dylan started working at Blackjack Pizza, a place where they would later purchase one of the guns used during the shootings. The other three weapons were purchased by Robin Anderson, a close friend of Dylan's. Around this time, they also built their first pipe bomb. In October of 1997, Eric, Dylan, and another friend, Zach, were suspended from Columbine High School for breaking into lockers. Then at the start of 1998, Dylan and Eric were arrested for breaking into a van. Both were ordered to attend the juvenile diversion program, but were released early due to how well they did. Just a month later, deputies found a pipe bomb near Eric's house. Eric's parents were becoming increasingly concerned about his anger issues by this time, and he started seeing a psychiatrist. He was also prescribed the antidepressant Zoloft. It was now that Eric's father started a journal, annotating his son's behavior. 
One significant event during this time was when Eric fell out with his friend Brooks Brown for continually being late when picking him up for school. When Brooks finally told him to find another ride, Eric smashed the windshield of Brooks' car with a rock. He also terrorized Brooks' family and had several altercations with his mother. To make matters worse, Eric started posting rants and remarks on his own website. This was reported to the police, but no action was ever taken. By April 1998, Eric began his own personal journal and started outlining plans for an attack. The date was set for April the 19th, 1999. Although this date was changed the week before the attack to the 20th, it's always been claimed that the original date was planned to coincide with the anniversaries of the Oklahoma bombing and the government fiasco in Waco. Even now, it's not known why they changed it to the next day. At this point, Eric also switched his medication to Luvox. By now, Eric had several websites that hosted Doom and Quake files, as well as gamers team information, along with rants about hatred for the people in the neighborhood and the world in general. This is where the Brooks hate was displayed. In preparation for the attack, in October 1998, Eric started the production of pipe bombs. The following month, Eric and Dylan got Robin Anderson to purchase two shotguns and a rifle at the Tanner Gun Show, as they were not 18 years old and Robin was. In March of the following year, Eric and Dylan made a video at Rampant Range with Mark Maines and a female friend of theirs. What'd it do? <laughs> Look at the top of the thing. Lead pellets all around. <laughs> a little lead for everyone. All right, I want to take out the tree. This is see what a slug does to the tree. Yeah, scoot back some. Ready? Yeah. That's a fucking slug! I imagine that in someone's fucking brain. And it hurt my wrist like a son of a bitch. I bet so. Let's see if we can Look at that. Get out of there. I got blood now. Huh? Oh. That thing ain't coming out. In the months before the attack, Eric and Dylan recorded some disturbing clips. Some transcripts are available online, although it's claimed the police destroyed the tapes. That seems unlikely, they have just not released them to the public, as of the request of both the boys' parents. However, there is some footage of the pair from a video they made for a school project. I need to Look, I don't care what 
what you say. If you ever touch him again, I will freaking kill you. I'm gonna pull out a goddamn shotgun and blow your damn head off. Do you understand, you little worthless piece of crap? People are always making fun of me. I don't like it. I really don't. It makes me mad. Ooh! If you don't fucking leave that fuck, fuck I know I'm gonna get off and show up so far of your ass, he's gonna friggin' three weeks! Just a few days before the massacre, Eric talked to a Marine recruit to look at the possibility of a career in the army. He was rejected due to his failure to disclose the medication he was taking. Although it's unlikely he knew this before the massacre, and it's not thought to have had any influence on his decision to attack. Dylan Klebold was born in Lakewood, Colorado, and was the youngest son of Sue and Tom Klebold. Both his parents were well respected in the community, where Tom worked as a geophysicist and Sue worked with disabled people. Dylan was a highly intelligent child, and when he attended Governor's Ranch Elementary School, was part of the CHIPS program for gifted and talented children. His mother said in her book, A Mother's Reckoning, that he was easy to raise, a pleasure to be with, a child who had always made us proud. They called him their sunshine boy. However, when he moved to Ken Carroll Middle School, where he met Eric, he found it hard to fit in, as he was so shy and quiet. But in Eric, he found a kindred spirit. He followed a similar path to Eric when the pair moved up to Columbine High School. And after they were suspended for lifting the locker combinations from the school's computer system, and then arrested for the theft from that van, Dylan and Eric's mother agreed to keep them apart. This was something that in reality could not be enforced. In 1997, a year before Eric, Dylan started a journal, and on July the 23rd of that year, he made his first entries in it about killing. He was also becoming increasingly irritable, depressed, and unmotivated. But despite his behavior, there were no red flags to indicate he and Eric were planning a mass murder, and his parents, although concerned, put it down to normal moody adolescent behavior and were reassured when just three months before the massacre, Dylan was released early from the diversion program. His counselor wrote, Dylan is a bright young man who has a great deal of potential. Things seemed to be going in the right direction for Dylan. The whole Klebold family even drove to Arizona to pick out Dylan's room, ready for when he started at the University of Arizona, where he planned to major in computer science. But Dylan was painfully shy and suffered from very low self-esteem. One such incident his mother shared occurred when they were in a fast food restaurant. There was a group of high school kids sitting down across the room from Dylan and his parents. Sue said that Dylan was incredibly anxious and wanted to leave, stating that the people were laughing at him. However, Sue said that they were not paying any attention to Dylan, yet he believed they were. However, perhaps an insight into Dylan's true mental state and violent fantasies 
occurred just weeks before the attack, when he handed in a school report that was so graphically violent that the teacher alerted his parents. When they questioned him, they accepted his explanation that it's just a story. The story was about a lone warrior clad in a trench coat who in graphic detail beat, stabbed and shot to death a group of college preps, then set off bombs to divert the attention of the police. Just three days before the massacre, Dylan dressed up in a smart black tuxedo ready for his prom date. His dad followed him around the house, filming him as he got ready and he later posed for photographs. His date was Robin Anderson, the same girl who had helped him and Eric purchase the three guns used in the attack. Robin and Dylan were not romantically involved. For Robin, it was more of a challenge. She boasted at the time that I convinced my friend Dylan, who hates dances, jocks, and has never had a date, let alone a girlfriend to go with me. I'm either really cute or just really persuasive. Dylan went by limo along with 12 others to the dance. His friend, Nate Dykeman, told reporters after the attack that nothing seemed unusual about that night and that everything went perfect. There really were no clear signs that despite Dylan was suffering and was severely depressed, that he would go on to shoot up a school just days later. In the aftermath of the shooting, it soon became apparent who the perpetrators were. They saw a flurry of untruths and speculation printed in the newspapers, a lot of which has now been proven to be untrue, and I want to look at some of those claims. They had been planning the attack for over a year, but not to enter the school and randomly shoot people. They planned a bombing on a massive scale, and if they had wired up the bombs they planted in the cafeteria correctly, they would have wiped out 600 people. They then planned to wait outside for the explosion and shoot any students who managed to escape. This would be followed by the detonation of the bombs they had packed in their cars, with the intention of killing more students along with rescue workers and reporters. Their hope was that all of this would be aired live on TV. Their fantasy was to create a nightmare so devastating that the entire world would know their names. But when the bombs failed to detonate, that is when they entered the building and randomly shot people, which was not their initial intention. The truth was, Eric Harris was a confident man and had plenty of friends at school. Dylan Klebold was slightly awkward and less confident, but was not bullied extensively any more than others. He also had a good group of friends. Both boys attended football games, dances, and school plays. And despite initial reports, neither of them were linked to the trench coat mafia or any other gang or goth culture. To say bullying did not have a role in the attack would be naive. And Columbine High School was notorious for bullies and giving privileges to jocks. However, they were not in their right mind and bullying only added to their pain. The killings were indiscriminate. They had no individual target, such as minorities, jocks, or Christians. Interestingly enough, Eric's friends described him as a sports enthusiast, and two of his friends were Asian and African American. It is true that Dylan asked jocks to stand up during the shooting in the library, and also made a racial remark as a black student. However, they did not target people specifically. It was initially reported that 17-year-old Cassie Bernal was hiding under a table when Eric Harris approached her and asked her whether or not she believed in God. When she replied yes, he shot her at point-blank range. This prompted Christians to hail her as a martyr for her faith. After further examinations of witness testimony, it was revealed that Bernal was not asked anything before she was shot. According to a witness who was hiding under the same table, Eric slammed his hand on the table and said peekaboo before fatally shooting Burnell. The confusion arose when another student in the library told investigators that he had heard one of the shooters ask a victim whether or not they believed in God, and the victim answered yes. He said that he recognized the voice as Burnell. However, he did not see the exchange happen as he was hiding under the table at the time. Investigators later took him back into the library and asked him to point to where he had heard the exchange come from. He pointed to the spot where Valine Schnur had been shot and was on the floor of the library when Dylan approached her. She said, oh my God, oh my God, don't let me die. He then asked if she believed in God. She said yes, and he asked why. She responded, because I believe and my parents brought me up that way. 
Dylan then reloaded his gun, but did not shoot her again, and Valine ultimately survived the massacre. Despite this explanation, the story of Cassie Bunnell being a martyr persisted for decades later. There is a belief that Eric was leaving trails before the attack, in the hope someone would stop him from doing what him and Dylan had planned, because one half of him wanted to commit mass murder, but the other did not. This is mainly due to the fact that he had a poster in his room, which they showed at the end of the basement tapes. It was of a bomb with a lit fuse and an arrow pointing to Columbine High School with the word clue. No one really knows whether it was made to let Eric's parents know their son was involved after they would have gone into his bedroom in case he and Dylan were blown to pieces during the attack, or whether it was a final middle finger to those around him for not seeing that he and Dylan were planning this for over a year and that he was able to plan this under everyone's noses. Eric also uploaded some files to the Columbine school computers the day before the attack and filled out a form online. Were these one last attempt to be stopped or did Eric want to try and outsmart people? In the immediate aftermath, those who were acquainted with Eric described him as well-spoken and nice. However, those who knew him well were not entirely surprised that he was involved, claiming he was displaying increasingly unpredictable behavior in the run-up to the attack. But Dylan's involvement was a complete shock to those who knew him, and even his parents maintained that they had no idea that their son was so troubled. Both boys had been in trouble, but nothing serious, just slightly wayward teenage behavior, certainly nothing that screamed killers. After viewing the basement videos and reading both boys' journals, the parents and investigators revealed that they were no ordinary troubled teenagers. The anger and resentment they displayed was so strong. Eric's journal starts with the declaration, I hate the effing world. Dylan's revealed he was not a hapless follower of Eric, who just tagged along. There was a dark side to him that few had witnessed. He was a very angry young man who wanted to hurt people and showed it in his words and body language. He and Eric both ranted about their hatred for schoolmates and revealed violent drawings and messages, as well as feelings of frustration and love. As well as giving an insight into the boys' mental states, they also revealed the meticulous planning that had gone into the attack. Some of the more chilling entries read as follows. On October 1998, six months before the attack, Eric wrote the following. Once I finally start my killing, keep this in mind. There are probably about a hundred people max in the school alone who I do not want to die. The rest must effing die. In a diary entry for the day of the shooting, April the 20th, 1999, Dylan marked precise details of the massacre, beginning with a 6 a.m. meeting between the two killers followed by a 10.30 a.m. setup and an 11.12 a.m. gear up. At 11.16 a.m., the time of the shooting, Dylan simply wrote, ha ha ha. Both killers had to-do lists and had ticked off all of their requirements for the massacre. These included get nails, get propane, fill my ammunition clips and finish fuses. Eric had also written down elaborate plans for their escape after the killing stating if they survived, they would escape to a country where they could not be extradited. If not, they would crash a plane into New York City. It goes to show how disturbed these boys were. But there were conflicting entries in Dylan's journal. He wrote of his love for a student. I hear the sound of her laugh. I picture her face. I just hope she likes me. He also filled page after page of drawings of hearts, intertwined with expressions of depression, sadness, and self-loathing, in addition to Eric and Dylan's journals, extracts from Eric's father's journals revealed that he was not overly concerned with his son's behavior. One entry read, We feel victimized. We do not want to be accused every time something happens. Eric is not at fault. Brooks Brown is out to get Eric. Also, something far more serious came to light. As we know, 13 months before the shooting, investigators discovered evidence that Eric was building pipe bombs and posting dozens of pages of obscene threats on the internet. At the time, investigator Mike Guerra had realized Eric may be a threat, and after putting all the evidence together, he wrote an affidavit outlining his fears and applied for a warrant to search Eric's house. However, the search warrant was never taken before a judge. Had it been, it's very likely Eric's stash of bomb-making equipment would have been discovered in his bedroom. It wasn't until after the attack that authorities read the affidavit 
panicked and then decided to keep it hidden. It was many years later before the truth about it came out. And even many of you may not be aware of that. It also took several years for Dylan's parents to admit that they had overlooked the fact their son was as unhappy as he was, failing to see clues that in retrospect were there all along. In 2016, Sue Klebold released her book, A Mother's Reckoning, Living in the Aftermath of Tragedy, which is a very gripping read. Eric's family have never spoken publicly about their son and refuse interviews. It was concluded that Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold were both radically different individuals, but both had complex, if opposite, mental conditions. Dylan was deeply depressed, suicidal, and easily influenced. He also showed through his journals he had a lot of love in his heart that conflicted with his self-loathing and resentment of everyone and everything that was festering a deep-seated anger that he needed to release. The last person he needed in his life was Eric. He was hiding the fact that he was a cold, calculated individual who wanted to hurt people. The rants in his journals and online posts were far more than just a troubled teenager. They exposed how disgusted he was with the world and those around him, and that he was set on punishing them on a grand scale. He was also an expert liar who was rational and aware of what he was doing to almost a scary level. He said in one of their home videos that he was spending less time with his family to make the process easier so he wouldn't get more attached. Eric's final journal entry, seven days before the massacre, is a very close representation of his true feelings. This was a boy who had written of rape and mass murder in the most disgusting ways, yet here, he just seems upset and unloved. It's speculated that his journal was meant to be seen by the media after the attack to give off the impression that Eric wanted people to see. However, his last entry is different. It's a true venting and why he feels the attack on the school has to happen. Although it's theorized that although Dylan had very dark thoughts, it's unlikely that without Eric, he would have acted on them. But Eric was able to manipulate Dylan into turning fantasy into reality. There is little doubt that Eric masterminded the attack although many still disagree with this. Dylan wanted to die, Eric wanted to kill. Many have speculated Dylan didn't want to commit suicide at home, but taking part in Columbine was the perfect excuse to end his life, although we will never really know. Eric, it seems, just wanted to kill people and destroy the school. When these two deeply disturbed minds merged, the result was catastrophic. This doesn't make either party any less guilty. Many blame Eric for roping Dylan in, and while this may be true to a certain extent, they both had a choice. Dylan, despite killing Les, was also ruthless when he did kill. And although it seems he wanted to die more than Eric, he still shot people point blank range with seemingly no remorse. Alone, would Dylan have done something like this? Would he have committed suicide eventually if his depression had not been kept under control? Perhaps. Can the same be said for Eric? Eric wanted to kill. It seems he did not really want to end his life anywhere near as much as Dylan did. He wanted to be known. He wanted everyone to remember him. And the chemistry of one wanting to die and one wanting to kill resulted in the most infamous school shooting the world has ever seen.